Dr. Hahn in reviewing the, quote, expert psychiatric testimony, Dr. Simpson discussed his findings with the prison's chief psychiatrist, Dr. David G. Schmidt. Together, they concluded that their findings did not confirm, quote, but in fact were strictly in conflict with the findings reported at Sir Hahn's trial. Quote, nowhere in Sir Hahn's test response, Dr. Simpson said in the affidavit, was I able to find evidence that he is a, quote, paranoid schizophrenic or, quote, psychotic, as testified by the doctors at the trial. The fact is, paranoid schizophrenics are almost impossible to hypnotize. They are too suspicious and do not trust anybody, including friends and relatives, not to speak, um, excuse me, I just lost that there, um, they do not trust anybody, including friends and relatives, not to speak of a hypnotist from, for him, the most hated race. Psychotics in general are among the poorest subjects for hypnosis. They cannot concentrate, they do not follow instructions, and basically do not trust. Sir Han, however, was an unusually good hypnotic subject. Sir Han asked me to hypnotize him, which I did not do, in order not to contaminate my test findings with fantasies. He himself had manufactured a hypno-disc and was practicing self-hypnosis in his cell, an activity requiring considerable self-control, which no psychotic has. The fact that Sir Han was easy to hypnotize, as testified by Dr. Diamond, proves he was not a paranoid schizophrenic. Quote, Dr. Diamond, Simpson continued, used hypnosis in six sessions out of eight with Sir Han. What was the purpose of it? To plant ideas in Sir Han's mind, ideas that were not there before? To make him accept the idea that he killed Robert F. Kennedy? When Dr. Diamond was unable to get Sir Han to admit that he wrote the net notebooks, he testified, quote, so I undertook, this is, by the way, is Simpson talking about Dr. Diamond. He testified, quote, so I undertook some experiments on possible hypnotic suggestion, unquote. This admission, writes Simpson, strongly suggests the possibility of hypnosis being used for implanting hypothetical ideas in Sir Han's mind rather than uncovering facts. A lie detector, not hypnosis, should have been used in finding out whether Sir Han killed Robert Kennedy. Now, uh, before we continue on, let me just point out one, one factor here besides the obvious things being stated here, and that is Sir Han's own increasing interest in hypnotism, as we're going to see later in the broadcast when we get to talking about uh, James Earl Ray and some other people. Um, it's possible that this interest in hypnotism could be in and of itself uh, evidence perhaps of... Uh, a lingering feeling, uh, an, an undefinable feeling on the part of a hypnoprogram subject that something is wrong and that uh, some kind of hypnosis is necessary to figure out what has been done. So again, this is just a possibility, but it does seem to crop up in other uh, similar cases. Going back to Operation Mind Control by Walter Bowert. Saran, Dr. Diamond concluded, had obviously had experience with hypnosis before. He found that Saran was reluctant to speak under hypnosis, but that he could easily write without being post-hypnotically blocked. Writing under hypnosis is called automatic writing, Diamond said, and the term aptly describes the way Saran would write like a robot and keep on repeating a word or phrase until I stopped him, unquote. Taking a sheet off a legal pad lying nearby, Diamond asked Saran to write his answers to the questions put to him in the hypnotic trance. He showed Saran a sample of his diary page. Is this crazy writing, Diamond asked. Yes, 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 Saran wrote. Are you crazy, Diamond asked. No, no, Saran wrote. Well, why are you writing crazy, Diamond asked. Practice, 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 Saran responded. Practice for what, Diamond asked. Mind control, mind control, mind control, is what Saran wrote. Now remember, Diamond hypnotizes Saran, testifies that he's a paranoid schizophrenic, and yet provides te uh, contradictory testimony that he was easy to hypnotize. Paranoid schizophrenics are, for all intents and purposes, as in Dr. Simpson's uh, testimony read earlier, impossible to hypnotize. So it appears that uh, Dr. Diamond's uh, analysis of Saran's situation is not only contradictory, but strongly suggests that, uh, as indicated in uh, Bowert's text, that Dr. Diamond was actually planting the idea in Saran's head that uh, he had killed Robert Kennedy. It's worth noting that... Uh, a lie detector is considered much, much more reliable than hypnosis, which frequently pollutes the results uh, in a criminal investigation, and yet uh, Diamond said he had no faith in a lie detector, but had a lot of faith in hypnosis. And while lie detectors are fallible, they're considered much, much more reliable than hypnosis. But again, remember that Diamond actually contradicted himself. Not only is there no evidence that Saran was a paranoid schizophrenic, but that Diamond's testimony that he was easy to uh, hypnotize basically confirms that.
Okay, now, uh, before Dave reads the next segment, I want to mention to you that this is out of a book that, if you are interested in the Robert F. Kennedy assassination, and obviously we don't have much time to talk about it tonight, although we are touching on it quite a bit because of the aspect of mind control, this is quite a good book, and as far as I know, it's available in a lot of libraries. You might want to go out and check out a copy if you'd like to. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very affecting and moving book, and, uh, and very interesting because it's written from, by people who are actually involved in trying to track this stuff down, as opposed to somebody sitting back as a spectator. The book is The Assassination of Robert F. Kennedy, and it's by John Christian, J-O-N-N, Christian, and William G. Turner. And it's, uh, Bill Turner, by the way, is a former FBI agent, and it's published in hardcover by Random House, copyrighted 1978. Now, uh, the... One of the interesting things that Christian and Turner present here is the fact that Saran Saran, that he, as indicated in Boer's text, was very, very easy to hypnotize and had probably been hypnotized before. Now, one of the things that came out in the course of the investigation, although it did not receive a great deal of emphasis by a special unit senator for reasons you may be able to divine at this point, was the fact that Saran Saran had been associated with a fellow by the name of Manley Palmer Hall. Now, Manley Palmer Hall was a master hypnotist. Interestingly enough, Manley Palmer Hall also served as uh, not only a hypnotist, but a sort of a guru to Los Angeles Mayor Sam Yorty. Yorty was mayor of Los Angeles when uh, Senator Kennedy was killed there in 1968. And uh, it's worth noting, too, that Sam Yorty was one of the people who emerged the morning after the assassination, tossing red herrings all about him by suggesting that Saran was a communist and had many uh, communist leanings, and then uh, Yorty made a, a, a flaming rectum out of himself by referring to the Rosicrucians as a communist organization. But it's interesting that the same, or one of the same hypnotists that Saran was associated with, was also uh, very, very close to Sam Yorty, a reactionary, a man tied to Patrick Frawley, a right-wing uh, luminary very close to Ronald Reagan, among others. And uh, interesting that Saran and Yorty, who uh, was so instrumental in presenting the, uh, in, in pointing the finger at Saran as a communist early on in the investigation, much as Lee Harvey Oswald, the alleged leftist, uh, was bruited about as an agent of Marxism. Again, both of them, both Saran and Yorty, connected to Manley Palmer Hall. Reading from the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Conveniently omitted was the fact that a police search of Saran's car yielded a volume entitled Healing the Divine Art by Manley Palmer Hall, founder of the Philosophical Research Society. The book mysteriously disappeared from the grand jury exhibits. Hall, a man with penetrating eyes, chiseled features, and a Buddha-like figure, was a master hypnotist with a practice in hypnotherapy. Some time ago, he had gained considerable publicity from hypnotic antics. On one occasion, putting under, unquote, a movie actor and convincing him he was suffocating, with the result that the actor tore apart a movie set in his frantic search for air. We queried Saran in San Quentin about Hall and his society. He wrote back that he remembered paying several visits to the headquarters, an alabaster temple near Griffith Park. The secretary there had a distinct foreign accent, unquote, he said. Hall's wife is German-born. And I had to ask her to unlock the bookcases for me to get the books I wanted to read in the library. I remember seeing Manley Hall himself there. Saran's dabbling with the occult society is, by itself, innocuous, but there is a certain irony in the fact that he was drinking from the same mystical fountain as Sam Yorty. For some two decades, the mayor had been a student of Hall, whom he regarded as his guru. Now, in the next section of Robert F. Kennedy, the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy by Turner and Christian, there is some discussion here of a, fe of a fellow named William Joseph Bryan, Jr. Now, William Joseph Bryan, Jr., uh, according to some speculation uh, engaged in by Turner and Christian, may have been the person who hypnoprogrammed Saran in the first place to uh, be in the um, in the the lobby, the pantry of the Ambassador Hotel. Uh, worth noting, maybe in passing, too, that the Ambassador Hotel was owned by G. David Shine, who uh, was uh, one of uh, Joseph McCarthy's assistants in the anti-communist witch hunt of the uh, early 1950s. But uh, this William Joseph Bryan, Jr. is a subject of some l lengthy discussion in the assassination of Robert Kennedy. All right, continuing on with the text. Our quest for Sir Hans Programmer had been no more successful than the search for Amelia Earhart until Dr. Herbert Spiegel gave us a lead. Anything mentioned in the presence of a subject under hypnosis is automatically etched into his mind, especially if it comes from the hypnotist, and it might flow out at any time. This brought us back to the notebooks containing Sir Hans, quote, automatic writing. Could he have scrawled something during a trance regression that the hypnotist had mentioned while programming him? 
There was a passage that stood out because it was, unlike the others, having nothing to do with horses, politics, money, or past acquaintances. It read, quote, God help me, please help me, salvo d, spelled d-i, d, salvo, die, s, salvo. The reference apparently was to Albert de Salvo, the notorious Boston Strangler. That case had been cracked by the use of hypnotism, and the hypnotist was Dr. William Joseph Bryan, Jr. of Los Angeles. Bryan billed himself as, quote, probably the leading expert in the world on the use of hypnosis in criminal law, and often boasted about being called into baffling cases by law enforcement agencies, including the LAPD. The Boston Strangler case was his tour de force, and he was incessantly mentioning it. An imposing man with a wrestler's girth, Brian claimed he was once drummer with a Tommy Dorsey band and a commercial air- airline pilot, airplane pilot. During the Korean War, he had put his hypnotic skills to use as, in his words, quote, chief of all medical survival training for the United States Air Force, which meant the brainwashing section, unquote. After the war, he reportedly became a CIA consultant in the agency's experimentation with mind control and behavior modification. Refused membership in all traditional medical societies, Brian set up a medical and hypnotherapy practice on the Sunset Strip in Hollywood, which he named the American Institute of Hypnosis. He used it as an aegis for wide-ranging symposiums on such topics as, quote, successful treatments of sexual disorders. Quote, I enjoy variety, and I like to get to know people on a deep emotional level, he once told a magazine interviewer. One way of getting to know people is through intercourse. In 1969, the California Board of Medical Examiners found him guilty of unprofessional conduct for sexually molesting four women patients who submitted under hypnosis. Despite his advocacy of sexual freedom, Brian was a Bible-quoting fundamentalist who belonged to a fire-and-brimstone sect called the Old Roman Catholic Church, which broke away from the Vatican over a century ago. Skipping down to the footnote, is curiously David W. Ferry, a prime suspect in New Orleans D.A. Jim Garrison's 1967 probe into the John Kennedy assassination, also belonged to this small sect. Ferry was found dead on February 22, 1967, shortly after being interrogated. should mention that Ferry himself was also a pilot, um, as, as was apparently Brian, or at least as Brian claimed to be. Anyway, so Brian was a member of the old Roman Catholic Church. Brian claimed to be a descendant of the fiery orator William Jennings Bryan, who opposed the teaching of evolution and celebrated Scope's monkey trial, and he frequently was a guest preacher at fundamentalist churches in Southern California. Only hours after the Robert F. Kennedy shooting, and before Sirhan had been identified, Brian appeared on the Los Angeles radio program of Ray Bream on KABC, and offhandedly commented that the suspect probably acted under post-hypnotic suggestion. Two years later, when Brian appeared on another local radio program, Christian, that's John Christian, the author, one of the authors, Christian called in and asked him about his prescient analysis on the Bream show. At first, Brian hedged, then declared that he had no professional opinion because he had not personally examined Sir Han. He quickly switched the subject to the Hollywood Strangler case in which a Henry Bush was executed for murder. Quote, he utilized self-hypnosis, Brian asserted, noting that Bush once tried to burn off his own arm with cigarettes under self-hypnosis, quote, to get rid of the offending part, just like the old thing in the Bible, you know, if the left hand offend thee, cut it off. When we, meaning the authors again, asked Sir Han about the DeSalvo entry in his notebook, he replied that the name was entirely foreign to him. Was it possible that Brian had placed Sir Han in a trance state and given his propensity to boast constantly about the Boston Strangler case, repeated DeSalvo's name over and over, thus etching it into Sir Han's subconscious. In any case, Sir Han would not remember either the circumstances of his exposure to the name or who mentioned it. Since Brian's ego seemed boundless, it was possible that an interview with him would produce the unexpected. It did. On June 18, 1974, Betsy Langman, a disarmingly attractive New York writer with whom we had been comparing notes, talked to Brian in his Sunset Strip office suite on the pretext of doing a general article on hypnosis. 